Good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. I just I just changed my speaker. Can you hear me now? Still? All right, thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. Very second one here. Good morning. All right. That looks like we're recording and everybody can hear me. And I can hear you, so that's good. Okay. Well, let's get started. We got a good turnout today, 28 people. I like that. All right. So we're going to be working today on module two, or are we? We might be starting module three. I'll have to see. Maybe a little bit. I, mean, I think we got into a little bit of module two. All right, let's take a look. Yes, yeah, so I was talking, I believe, about different kinds of bonding. So I was talking about the different kinds of bonding and how we can look at the periodic table and be able to figure out, but just based on their positioning on the periodic table, where the, what kind of bonding we, there would be between those two elements. 
So going back to what I was talking about here, so X and Y are the two elements that we're dealing with. If we're looking at elements where we have Na and Cl, for example, we know that because of the electronegativity trend, that F is going to have a big electronegativity, whereas something over here is going to have a small one. And what that means is that the difference between them, the change or the delta electronegativity is going to be fairly large. Now, if we've got something where it's carbon and chlorine, you can see that carbon and chlorine are here and they're fairly close together on the periodic table. And what that means is that the bond bonding between them is kind of going to be in between ionic is going to be between ionic and somewhere between non-polar covalent. So the electrons in the bond are going to be in between the carbon and chlorine, but closer to the chlorine because the chlorine is a little bit more electronegative. So the electron depth is not really in the middle of the bond as it is here in the non-polar covalent, but in the pole, sorry, in the non-polar covalent. In the non-polar covalent, you can see it is in the middle. And what that means is the difference electronegativity between these two elements is going to be zero. So in summary, what I can tell you is when you've got two elements and they're far apart, metals and non-metals, for example, it's going to be ionic. When you've got two non-metals, they're in the same region and they're different, it's likely to be non-polar covalent, sorry, polar covalent, I should say, polar covalent, sorry. And if it's the same element, on both ends of the bond, then it's going to be non-polar covalent. Does anybody have any questions? Now in questions um, that- Wait, I do. Sorry, go on, Joseph. Oh, uh, so metal, metal and non-metal is ionic. Small difference is non-polar. Uh, no difference is, no, small difference is polar. No difference is non-polar, correct? Yeah, no, no, yeah, no, I'm having trouble hearing you here. It's my, it's my fault. I'm just trying to get this uh, right. Can you say it again? My speaker's also messed up. So large difference between a metal and a non-metal is ionic. Small difference between a non-metal and a non-metal is polar. And no difference between the same thing is non-polar, correct? Right. I think that's right. Okay. For some reason, it's not picking up by... Uh, my headset here, but I'll figure that out later. All right. Now, what you'll always get when you're given these questions is the electronegativity values themselves. So you could just do the math and use this table here to determine what kind of bonding you're getting. But I really feel like it's easier just to look at the periodic table and just go by the pure distance between them. Large distance, large difference in electronegativity, small distance, small difference in electronegativity. And that's that's really, I think all you really need to be aware of. All right, any other, any other questions? Right, I think most of you are aware of how to count elements or atoms. So if you had something like this bottom one here, Cr3PO42, and I drew a picture of it. Somebody needs to mute themselves here. I'm not sure who it is. I'll figure it out in a second though. So that means there are three chromiums, two phosphoruses, and if we have four and four, that would be eight oxygens here. But I'm often fond of drawing out these little pictures here when I'm in doubt about how many atoms I might be seeing of something. Remember what the parentheses mean? It means there's two, in this case, it means there's two of those entire groups attached to the chromium. And 
I think that's pretty much all I have wanted to cover here. Everything else you can handle on your own. But those are the main things that are going to be, be talked about in the, in the homework as well. So hopefully some of you have gotten, gotten in and done the module one homework. It's not particularly difficult. I think it's a good one to sort of get your feet wet a little bit. And then the um, module two, you should be able to do now as well. Does anybody have any other questions they want to ask so far about module two, especially if you've already done some of the work on it? Just a reminder, and this was what I had said the other day, when you're doing the homework, Per the syllabus, you do the assignment first and you need to get 80% on that. You can do it as many times as you like. And there is a video here that gives you answers for all of the questions in that assignment. So if you're having trouble with any of the questions, you can go look at the video for that as well. Then you've got the practice quiz. You need 80% on that and that will open the credit quiz and you get two attempts at that. All right, any questions? Okay, we'll move on to module three. And this is where we're going to be dealing a lot with our friends, significant figures, which I know a lot of you don't like, but we are going to be dealing with them nonetheless. So let's look at down here. Just a reminder, if you haven't got your video on, I'd like you to put it on. Just seeing if it is actually on. Anyway, so it's just a reminder. I'm not going to worry about it right now. Okay. So these conversions, you don't have to memorize them. They are given to you as part of any any test materials you'll be using. But you know, if you're doing the homework, obviously then you can have this in front of you because you know the homework is completely open book. So you can just use whatever copy you have of this that's in front of you. So there's all the conversion factors you'll need. And again, you don't have to memorize them. I'm still attempting to activate my video. I worked the other day. Okay, thanks, Zachary. Excuse me, Professor. Yes, code. Do we use um, the soft assignments? You already are breaking up here, code. Like our like the uh, homework to use the conversion table. I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Sorry, you cut out. Oh, do we use the soft chalk? for our homework. You could. Conversion but, table. You, you could, but you, you are more likely to print out or have the survival guide in front of you. So what that, what that means is you, you could print out this module three file, the PDF file, and that has it in there as well. Or you would have gotten, or you would have gotten it from the- Yeah or you would have gotten it from the actual um, uh, bookstore. So this is the module three document I'm talking about. Okay. And you can see that this will have the, this will have the conversion chart in there. You can print this out. You see it? Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the method we'll be using to solve these conversion problems is called the dimensional analysis method. And it's predicated on the notion that if we start with something, then we can do times and then use a conversion factor here in a certain in a certain setup that will allow us to actually get the correct answer and without guessing which goes on top and which goes on the bottom so if you were asked how many quarts there are in 2.00 liters
then what you would do is do the 2.00 liters and times. Now, what I like to do is I like to do the units before I put any numbers in. So I know that liters goes here and then, sorry, that doesn't happen. Watts goes up here, because that's what I want. And somebody's saying something to me, and I'll get that in a second. And liters goes on the bottom. And these numbers here, the 1.0566882 and the one liters, that comes from the conversion, the conversion chart. So going back up here to the conversion chart, you can see where I get those numbers from. There it is there. One liter is 1.056682 quarts. And you might be wondering, well, do, do you have to use all those numbers? And the answer is yes, because when you've got all of those figures mentioned, it's because that's not an exact number. And these three dots are indicating that this number keeps on going on and on and on. Whereas with you've got, if you've got one kilometer and 1,000 meters, that's exact. And we say that that has, that both of those have infinite significant figures because those are arbitrarily, those are arbitrarily those values. So one kilometer is a thousand meters. One liter is 1.056682, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff after that as well that we don't mention, but we still, we're still obliged to use those entire numbers right there. All right, let me see what the chat, is here. Your voice is cutting out a lot. All right. Let me try turning my, <laughs> I'll try turning my headset around and see if that helps. Uh, professor. Yeah. I have a quick question about the yeah. assignments, the, um, and the soft chalk. Mm -hmm. Is there a, yeah. is there a specific periodic table that we should be using? Cause I know the, average mass is different for all of them slightly different um it, it, no i it not not for the first few not for the first few modules okay because i was looking through them and there's no pure table given what in in the in in which for what for which thing I, in the module one assignment where i'm looking for um where i was looking for no well um, then then you can use the then you can use the one that's in the module folder oh it's one of the module folder yeah, yeah. okay thank you i to look there thank you i'll show you where that is just so you can see oh i can, uh, I can see it right now I, I was i'm looking oh through. okay all right oh, fair enough thank fair you enough. so it's uh, whoever was am i is my voice better now i, I guess I, I don't think i had my microphone set up properly i thought it would default but it didn't default properly yeah it's great thank you all right good uh let's see i think it was yeah jenna jenna are you can you i'll i'll get you to uh, to tell me is it's my voice good. still cutting out no it's good now. all right thanks jenna appreciate it thanks for letting me know okay so going back to what we were talking about here So we've got these values and that's what that's what goes in to those specific slots. But you'll notice I, I like to do the 1.0, actually 1.056688. Yeah, yeah. So you need you need to use all of those numbers. And that's over one liter. And again, we get these numbers off the uh, conversion table. So then we can go ahead and do the math on that. And you can see that the math would just be the 2.00 times the 1.056682. And that will, that will provide us with a value that is three significant figures. Now we haven't looked at three, that significant figures yet, but the 2.00 has three significant figures. The 1.056682 has, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the answer is going to come out to be three significant figures, which is going to be 
the answer for this particular problem. Now it is also going to be rounded as well and we'll get to rounding in a second too. Let me see what the question is here. Your voice is cutting out again. Well, there's not much, a whole, not a whole lot I can do about it. I've already set up my microphone. So I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, you think it's by internet connection? Well, it might be. All right. Let me, let me see if I can do something to fix it. All right, uh, there's not much I can do about the internet connection, unfortunately. I'm going to have to stick with it the way it is, but I, in future growth, I'm going to have to do this from a different location. So that's, uh, that's where I'm at right now. Uh, I will, uh, well, I'm not sure exactly what else I can do to, to fix the problem right now, because I can't really move from where I'm at. Okay, am I, am I still freezing? When cutting out it's not periodic it's, it's periodic it's like yeah it's not always in the same time or it, i think it's just internet pulsing just occasionally right wherever it does well i'm just going to have to deal with it for today and um, in the future i'll try and do it from a different location where i'm i have more uh, more control over my internet connection or i can try um i can try doing a direct ethernet connection but i don't have the the ability to set that up right now All right, but it will be fixed in the future. I'll do something. All right. So let's look at significant figures here. And the graphic I have here is a good demonstration of why significant figures are important. So it's always about how accurate a device is that we're actually using to do a measurement because significant figures are based on measurements. It's always going to be, the number is always coming from something that you've measured. So for example, if you've got a situation where you've got a graduated cylinder and you've only got two graduations and you've got a meniscus here for a volume measurement, then we know that that measurement is somewhere between 100 and 200, but we can't really be exactly sure where. We're sure of the first digit, which is one. So we know it's 100 and something, but we're not entirely sure of the second digit, which could be a four, it could be a five, or even possibly a six, depending on how you want to eyeball it. And the third digit, we definitely have no idea about at all. So when we're determining significant figures, it's always every digit that we're sure of, and then one digit we're not so sure of. And then if there's other mm. digits required, we put in a zero. And the zero here is called a placeholder. And we need the zero to determine the magnitude. 
it's like we have no clue what that number should be. So we just put a zero in by default. But it's not a true zero. It's just a number that we're putting in in order to make sure that you know, we know 15 is not the right measurement. So we know it has to be 150. So that's why the zero is there. But that zero is not considered to be a significant digit. It's there to define the magnitude of the measurement, the size of it. Now, if you're using a more accurate graduated cylinder, like the one I'm showing you here, then the line is between 200 and 201. We're very sure of the first three digits for 200, zero, zero, we're definitely sure of, but we're not so sure of the next digit. It's just above the line. We could make it 200.0 and we're not sure of that zero, but it could be 200.1 as well. So that would have four significant figures. So the first, so the second case, case B is much more accurate than case A, which only has two significant figures. Does anybody have any questions so far? Now, one thing that's, that's kind of going to blow your minds here with a measurement is that a measurement is not really a true single number. So if you've got 150 mils as the measurement, it's actually representative of somewhere between 154 and 145. So those are the only so, so there could be any number that lies in between there. And you don't know what the exact number is, but you know it just lies somewhere in between there. And that's what this 150 is actually representing. It's not representing a pure number or an exact number. It's actually representing a range. Likewise, for 200.0, is actually a number that lies somewhere in between 200.04 and 200, no, 199.95. So it could be anywhere in that range that where we could expect to see the actual number that this is actually representing. So that's the thing. I don't, you've got to get out of the mindset of thinking that these are all ways exact digits or exact numbers that we're dealing with. No, they're representative of ranges because we're not sure of the last digit. And that's the whole point because it's a measurement and we had to eye eyeball it. So we just don't know. So the rules, the rules for determining significant figures, all non-zero digits are significant captive zeros, which are zeros between two digits, non-zero digits are always significant as well. So 904, that zero is significant. But the issue of significance comes into play when we're dealing with zeros that are either at the front or at the back. Now leading zeros are never significant. So those are the numbers out the front here, the zeros out the front. Now I can give you a reasoning for that, or at least an explanation as to why that's the case. When you've got 0 0.000932, that is actually not the only way that that can be represented. It could be represented as follows, 9.32, times 10 to the negative four, which clear, clearly has three significant figures, but the zeros out the front here are not significant. They're placeholders. They're just there to define the magnitude or the size of the number. Does anybody have any questions? It was like up here when I was dealing with the 150 
this one is not significant because if we're just using it again as a placeholder, something to define the magnitude of the number. And that brings us to the, the second rule here. Trailing zeros are any zeros to the right of the last non-zero digit. Trailing zeros are significant only if there is a decimal point in the number. If there's no decimal point, like there was up here, that zero is not significant. It's considered to be a placeholder. So that means that there's a difference between these two numbers. So let me show you. So if you've got one five zero, and I'm telling you that that zero is not significant. And if I had one five zero dot, then those two would be actually different numbers. Now, why is that? 150 is representative of some sort of value between 154 and 145, because anything in there could be rounded to that. Now, 150 dot is actually some kind of number between 150.4 and 149.5. Again, any number in that range could be rounded to 150 dot. So that dot makes all the difference between the accuracy because it actually makes that zero significant. And it does help define the accuracy of the number. If I had 151 mils, you'd have no problem telling me that it was three significant figures. Why should the zero be penalized just because it's a zero? The reason we put the dot after it is to put in the decimal point to determine that it is actually a significant figure. Without that dot, it's simply a placeholder. So we need a way of defining whether a zero is significant or not. And we do that by putting in the dot. Does anybody have any questions? So when you've got three, four, five, zero, zero, then those three, four, five are significant, but the zeros aren't. But if you had 3.4500 zero, zero times 10 to the fourth, then those zeros would be significant because of the decimal point in the number. So for rounding, we're just going to use sta standard rounding rules. And the idea here is, let's say you needed a certain number of significant figures, in this case, three. What you're starting out with has six significant figures. So what we do is we count out the first three significant figures that we see, which in this case is 862. And then we look at the next digit. If that next digit is four or less, then we keep the two the way it is. If the, excuse me, if the number is between five and nine, then we raise the last number by one. So there's an example of that down here. So you've got 0 0.0962762. If we just need three significant figures, then it would be 0 0.0963 because the next digit is a seven and that will round that number up to a three. Does anybody have any questions about rounding? Okay, when we're looking at addition and subtraction, we use different rules than if we're do, dealing with multiplication and division. Addition and subtraction are based on the number of places past the decimal point, whereas multiplication and division are based upon the number of significant figures in the numbers. So when I'm talking about 
places past the decimal point, I'm talking about counting numbers that are past the decimal. So 12.620 has three places past the decimal. Zero, uh, 6.0 has one place past the decimal. Now the concept here is that a number can be no more accurate than the least accurate number used to get in that calculation. So what I'm saying is that the least accurate number in this calculation is the one with one place past the decimal. So the answer can't be any more accurate than that either. So in your calculator, if you put this in, it'd come out to be 18.620, but then this would need to be rounded to one place past the decimal. Does anybody have any questions so far? Likewise, in this subtraction here, we don't get 17.142 if we stick this in our calculator. But what we do get, we have to take down to the smallest number of places past the decimal point, which is three for the top number because the bottom number has seven. So the number that we, we get as an answer has to only contain three places past the decimal. Does anybody have any questions? When we're dealing with multiplication and division, the rules change and we need to deal with significant figures. So in the case of 4.01 times 62.753, we count all of the figures, the significant figures, which should be three significant figures for the top, five for the bottom one. So the answer can only contain three. Again, when we put this in the calculator, it doesn't come out to be 252, it comes out to be something else that needs to be rounded to three significant figures. Does anybody have any questions? So powers and roots, they have the same rules as multiplication and division do. So in this module and in the soft chalk, I have a worksheet. I'd recommend doing the worksheet, there's answers as well. So I'd strongly recommend doing that worksheet. It's good practice for doing significant figures. A lot of students hate significant figures. They think they're useless and they, and they don't want to learn them. But in the end, it's going to cost you points if you just blow them off. So let's look at some problems here. So for this one, we're trying to convert inches to centimeters. So 4.00 inches to centimeters. So what I would do is I do 4.00 inches, new times then a line. And I know that it's going to be inches on the bottom so that they cancel and centimeters will go on top. So this is going to have to be figured out based upon whether there is actually a conversion that allows us to go directly from centimeters to inches. And in this case, there actually is, it goes one inch is 2.54 centimeters. However, if there wasn't a direct conversion that would necessitate needing to use two steps. And that's how you know, if you can't do it directly in one step, that's how you know you're going to need to need, you're going to need to use two steps. But we'll do one of those examples in a minute. But for this one, we can see it's 2.54 centimeters as one inch. Then we do the math on that. And what we're expecting to get is something that has three significant figures. You'll notice that we got one inch, that one is an exact number. The 2.54 is also an exact number. The reason we know it's an exact number is because it doesn't have dots after it. And that's what, that's how I've signified that these are not exact numbers. 
and there's more digits to come, but there's no more digits after 2.54. This is, has, this effectively has infinite significant figures. Now, when we do the math on that, it comes out, I think, to be 10.16, and that gets rounded to 10.2 as the final answer. We can see that here. And that's because 4.00 has three significant figures, so the answer has to have three significant figures as well. Does anybody have any questions? All right, so let's look at something where we do have to do more than one conversion. And the way I would handle that if we were doing 15.2 feet to centimeters, I might look at the conversions first and just see if there is a direct conversion that allows us to go from feet to centimeters. So when I do that, and I'm looking at all these lengths here, I don't see any indication of a way to go, go directly from feet to centimeters. So what I know I need to do here is look for something that links feet and centimeters. So what I see here is one foot is 12 inches, but I also see one inch is 2.54 centimeters. So what I'm saying here is that we need to have some kind of unit that links the two units that we're looking for. In this case, it's going to be inches. So that's how I know that I would definitely need to do two steps here for this specific problem. So I do two times and then a line, then another times in a line. So what goes here for the units? Now remember, I'm not putting in any numbers yet. I'll just put the units in. I know feet are going to go on the bottom. I know centimeters is going to go at the end because that's what I want. But I also know then that inches will go in these other two slots. Now, according to the conversions, 12 inches is one foot and 2.54 centimeters is one inch. After I've done the math on that, I'm going to come up with 463 centimeters. The 12 and the one, the 2.54 and the one have infinite significant figures. So the answer is going to be based upon the number of significant figures I start with. And 99% of the time, that's how it's going to be for you as well. You really only have to look at the number you're starting with in order to determine how many significant figures you're going to have at the end. Does anybody have any questions? For the temperature conversions, on the test, you'll actually be given these conversions. You don't have to memorize them. There's the K equals C plus 273.15. You'll be given that. And you'll also be given I think this one here at 5F minus 9C is 160 to convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius. Uh, let's, uh, we, we'll take a look in a minute for exactly what you're getting, but I think you get some other things as well in order to help you with those conversion factors. So you don't have to memorize any of these conversion factors for temperature. But let's talk about a couple of examples here. The way that we handle significant figures with temperature conversions is because temperature conversions are always addition subtraction. We're always looking at the smallest number of places past the decimal. So for 298, once we do the conversion and we're using 273.15 for that conversion, it comes out to be 25 degrees because that has zero places past the decimal. Now 
Now take a look at this one, converting Celsius to Fahrenheit. Let's say we use 5F minus 9C equals 160. Well, we can do some algebra there and we can substitute in the 37.0 for the C and then solve for F. Now, when we do this, we need to be mindful of how many places past the decimal we have in the number we started with. In this case, it's zero. Uh, it's a, there's one place past the decimal and that's the zero there. So the answer comes out to be Fahrenheit is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I know what some of you might be saying. You're saying, well, you know, I didn't, didn't I just say this is all addition subtraction and yet, and yet I see this 5F minus 9C, that looks like multiplication to me. Well, it turns out that the five and the nine are actually exact numbers. So what that means is that 5F is going to be really F added to itself five times. So it's really F plus F plus F plus F plus F plus F, that's 5F. So it's really all addition subtraction because the five and the nine are exact numbers. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, let's take a look. Let's take a look at module three and the homework you'll need to do for that. Now, as I said, there's videos explaining how to do all of these problems in the assignment. And how they're supposed to be set up. So for question one, for example, it's matching. So you need to figure out what goes in the one slot, what goes in the two slot. It's really just a matter of looking at the units and I know that in the two slot, you'll have one meter. And in the one slot, you'll have, you'll have the uh, 100 centimeters there. So that's all it's really a matter of just going through and doing that. And there are some here like this one, five, six, 80 centimeters is how many kilometers. I know in the two slot, it's going to be centimeters. I know in the three slot, it's going to be kilometers. And then it just remains to figure out what goes in the one slot and the four slot. And those are going to be related to each other. One kilometer is a thousand meters. So that's going to be in the four slot. And one meter is a hundred centimeters. That's going to go in the one slot. So you could just do it on a sheet of paper, but really what I'm trying to get you to do here is realize where the units need to go in order to make sure everything cancels and you're left with what you want. Does anybody have any questions about the assignment here? I'm gonna to have to submit this to get out of it. All right, does anybody have any questions? Have I cut out at all in the last, say, 20 minutes since we were having problems initially? No, not at all. Okay, that's good. Looks like it's stabilized a bit and that's nice. Okay. Uh, let's go back course content. Now, let me show you what's going on with the practice. Now the practice in every case is always the same formatting as the credit quiz. 
and what you're required to do here, instead of doing a mold, a matching type thing, it's going to be actually typing in the actual values. So you would type them in as they appear on the conversion chart and making sure that everything goes in the correct slot. Now, remembering what I said about temperature conversion, excuse me, those are going to be subject to the significant figures as well. So you'd find whatever answer was close. And in this case, it says 56 degrees Celsius. You would know then that whatever answer you were going to come up with the degrees Fahrenheit is going to have no places past the decimal. So it's going to be whatever is closest, but has no places past the decimal. Do we need to show work on our uh, notebook for the assignments? No. Okay. No, because you're pretty much showing the work while you're doing them. All right. So the practice quiz then will tell you exactly what kind of formatting and what kind of questions you're going to see on the credit quiz. And then you'll have two attempts at the credit quiz. Does anybody have any questions? All right, let's take a look at how that would look on the real test that you'll be taking. So what I'll do is I'll go over to here to the test one folder. And here is your sample module one to six test. Now, along with that, I have a study guide. So I want to point this out to you as well. So let me open the study guide here and you'll see exactly what is going on with that. So test one question types. The first question will be about electron diagrams for atoms. Two would be expected charge of ion. I'll show you this in a second. And questions three to four, it could be a mixture of any of these kinds of problems that you're seeing listed between three and four. So each time you take the sample test, you'll, you might get a different one of these. And by taking it multiple times, that's how you'll get to see examples of all of these different kinds of questions that are possible for questions three to four. But it's very clear, it's very transparent exactly what kinds of problems you're going to be getting in each instance. Then when we go down to module three, you can see you get a problem that involves dimensional analysis requiring one step and then dimensional analysis requiring two steps. Does anybody have any questions so far? All right, so let me open up that sample module test there so you can see exactly what you're going to see. And remember that the test you'll be taking will be the same as the sample test that I got here. So you'd be crazy not to do it, even crazy and not to get the extra credit for that as well. So you can see you've got the periodic table there and just like I said, you've got a diagramming, a diagramming electrons question. Then you've got an ion question. And questions three and four were those mixtures. Here we've got groupings, and then we've also got energy levels as well. Question five was the bonding question. And question six here is an ordering question, in this case about ionization energy. For the module three questions, the ones we've just been looking at, you can see they're very similar to what you're doing in the homework. Professor, I yes. have a question. Um, for the, so let's say we do have a test, like the, for the actual test, and we wanna have like a printed out version of the um, periodic table and the conversion sheets, can we, do that or does it no, have to be the one no, that's no because you're given a you're given it in the in the test you just have to scroll up and look at it okay so just scrolling yeah 
Okay. But it's you're going to have the same things in the real test as you have in this test. Okay. All right. So you need to, that's why I'm saying you need to be able to do this sample module one to six test closed book. And if you can do that and get 90% consistently, then I don't see how you can fail the real test. I just, I just don't, I just don't think it's possible. All right, any, any questions? All right, so since we've gone through these, I'm, I'm, I'll go through these specific questions that we have here in this test and just give you an idea. So if you've got a diagram, you want to diagram an atom of sulfur. So you can, again, look, you've even got the listing of elements and compounds. You don't even have to memorize which element goes with which, uh, which, which symbol, I'm sorry, elements and symbols are all there as well. That's a, that's kind of a gift too. But let's say you were looking at sulfur. Look where it is on the periodic table. Sulfur's down here. You'd have two. You'd have two in the first row. Remember, H is just mentioned twice here, so it's really just two. Then you've got eight in the second row, and then you've got one, two, three, four, five, six in the third row. So that's how you would. That's how you'd handle it for the question. So it'd be two eight and then six. For the diagramming, sorry, for the ions, we've got seven valence electrons. It just wants to have eight. So what it will do is it will gain one, which means the charge would be negative one. And you can go back and you can take a look at the last lecture to, for more details about that. Which grouping does MN belong? Well, that's a transition metal. And again, you go back up to the periodic table to look at that. The number of energy levels for SN. Well, let's see, SN is down here. So it'd be five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so that would be the answer for that one, five. for the bonding, we talked about this. This is between C, A and O. So what we do is we look at the periodic table and we look at the relative positioning of calcium and oxygen. You can see that they're very far apart, which is going to indicate they're most likely going to be an ionic kind of bond. So you select ionic. The next one, ionization energy. And it's looking for the highest ionization energy to the lowest in this case. And it was A, G, R, B, and I, I think. Yeah, A, G, R, B, and I. So the highest ionization, you've got I, you've got A, G, and you've got R, B. They all happen to be in the same row here. You can see them there. The highest ionization energy is going to be I because it's closest to helium. And the one with the lowest ionization energy is going to be R, B because it's closest to francium. So you'd have to know those corners and which one is highest and lowest out of that. So this one, the highest ionization energy is going to be I, so that's going to be one. And then the lowest ionization energy is going to be RB, so that'll be three, which makes it two here. These don't have to be one, two, three, it could be ordered differently. So when you're doing these kinds of problems with the conversions, you see you've got the conversion factors here. So if it was 174 quarts and we're looking for liters and you know it's one step, so you know you'll be using this as your conversion factor. So you'd have to put those in in the correct way. I'm not going to do that here because we've just been through it. Same with the second problem that involves two steps. Then you've got your multiple choice conversion problem here. And again, it goes as far as significant figures go, it goes by number of places past the decimal. So 237K, that has no places past the decimal. Your answer is going to have no places past the decimal once you figure that out. 
All right, does anybody have any, any questions? All right, so what should you be doing up to this point? Well, you should be working on doing the homework and now you can do the homework for modules one, two and three. And I definitely would, I did, wouldn't leave it till the last minute. And going back, I'm going to go back to the syllabus here and just show you this to make sure you do understand exactly what you're doing. And as it was stated here in test one and two, the test one grade is made up of homework and test one itself. So 20% is for homework. So you really do need to do the homework, but keep in mind also, you've got your 5% here. So if you didn't want to do all the homework, you could at least do the sample test extra credit and that could make up for some of the homework you didn't do. But you definitely need, are going to need to do homework if you want to try and get an A on question on, on test one. And a good way to do that is to make sure you do all the easy stuff that it goes with the homework. The stuff we've done so far is pretty easy. It shouldn't take you very long to get the homework done. I still get complaints about it from people, but you know, this is, this is how I've got it set up. You know, if everybody was getting a hundred percent on these tests, then, you know, maybe I wouldn't require the homework, but because people are still not getting 100% on these tests or even 90%, then it indicates that they do need to do more. And if you understand what's going on, the homework won't take you very long at all. If you don't, then you need to do the homework anyway. All right, uh, let's see. Let's look at the schedule here, see where we're at. Actually, yeah, we did a little bit ahead here. So we did modules one and two. There's no class on Monday because it's Labor Day and we'll continue with module four on Wednesday. All right, so does anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? That might require too much internet. Any questions? All right, well, we'll leave it there here for today. And I will, uh, if anybody wants to stay and ask me anything, they can, and I'll, uh, I'll see you all later. Um, actually, I have a question, but it's for your lab class. So I don't know if you okay. wanna- Okay, just, just, just hang about for a second and yeah. I'll, I'll see. All right, anybody else have any, if anybody else has any questions, you can hang around. Otherwise, I'll see you all later. Thank have you. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you. you, Professor. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Thanks, everybody. Joseph, what, what's your question, yeah. buddy? Oh, so for the extra credit that you offer for doing the the lab before, is it three days before yeah, the due date? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's, well, no, three days after it's after the lab has actually been completed. So, well, your lab's on Monday, right, Joseph? Yeah. Yeah, so if you do it by Thursday, 11.59 p.m., you'll get that. Oh, okay. Just for the results, though. Okay, thank you. All right, is that all? Yep, that's it. That's all okay. I wanted to ask, because I was a little confused by that. Thank you. Okay, no worries, Joseph. Thanks. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, any other, any other questions? I have a question about your lab. Yes, Coden. Um, do we need to write anything in our lab book for this first safety lab? No. Okay. I was wondering. No, you're good. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great day. See you. Uh, now I have a question for the lab. Is this notebook okay? Uh, Abram, ha hang on. I, I need to, let me, let me see. I can't, I, let me see if I can see you. Give me a second, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes, Abram. That would be fine. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Professor. Yeah, it's a good one. I like those because you can easily open them. Yeah. And it stays yeah. open. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be cool. Okay, thank you, Professor. Cheers. All right. Have a good day. You too. I'll see you later. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Maximus, are you good? Uh, yeah, I just got a question. Can you hear sure. me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, okay. Um, I was wondering, so if I work ahead, like if I finish test one in like a week or two, yes. is it okay if like that I move on to like yes. the next? Um, yes, yes. Test? Go, as fa go as fast as you like. But then uh, would, would it be mandatory to still attend the Zoom meetings though? No, no. And the me Zoom meetings were never mandatory. The Zoom meetings were never mandatory to begin with. Oh, okay. No, they're, if you look in the syllabus, they're optional. I don't, I don't take attendance. I recommend coming to them, but yeah. if you're working ahead, you're doing everything you need to do, then you know, maybe, maybe you don't need to worry about it. But let's say, let's say you work ahead and you reach a point that you say, oh gosh, um, I don't really understand what's going on here. Maybe you wait, maybe you wait till the, till I cover it in a Zoom meeting, you know, and you, you see the whole, and you see the whole story. But chances are, I mean, if you're working that far ahead and you've already gotten other stuff done, I don't think you're going to have that much trouble and you should be okay. Okay. All right. Also, uh, the test is, do we only have like one attempt? Because my last chemistry class, we had two attempts on a test. So is there only one attempt? There is only one attempt, but you've got to remember it is the same as the sample test. Yeah. So if you're taking the sample test multiple times, then you, this shouldn't be really a much of a concern. Yeah. And uh, this might also be a question, but did a assignment like really like weigh into like the overall like module credits, like in the what's, grade book? What's that, sorry? Does like the assignments, do they count like heavily no. towards like the overall module assignment? Well, all I can tell you is the or homework, the homework counts for 20%. 20%. Yeah. And where have I got it up here? Yeah. You see in the grading, the homework counts for 20%. So out of the two points that is like in the grade book for each module, it's only 20%. That's no, fine. no, no. Those are the actual points you're getting. So what you'll do is you'll do the, when, when you do a, a credit quiz, let's say you get a hundred percent, then you'll get those two points. But if you look oh, at the okay. grade book, let me show you the grade book so you can see this. I'm going in as a student here so you can see this. So if you look at the, if you add all this up, two plus two plus two plus two plus two plus four plus two plus four, that adds up to 20. Okay. And then what happens is that this test one is out of 350, but then it's converted into 80 points. And that gets added to whatever scores you had here for the, for these quizzes. Okay. But in order to get to those credit so, quizzes, you have to do the assignment the practice test, and then you, you, do, you do the credit quiz, and then you get whatever score you get here. And then that all gets added into your, um, to your final score. Right. So the practice, quizzes they don't count towards our grade at all right they don't but you have to do them in order to get to the credit yeah. quiz. yeah yeah you have to get at least an 80 percent to take the credit quiz that's right so overall it's only the assignment and the uh, credit quiz that really counts no just the credit quiz oh just the credit quiz so yeah, the i think so see 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 how it works out so to get to the module one credit quiz you have to do the assignment the practice quiz, you get zero points for each of those, but then you get to do a credit quiz, which is worth two points. Oh, okay. So wait, so does that mean that the module assignment is worth zero? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. So you can just get like the minimum score and you could just go ahead and work ahead. Yeah, that's right. 80%, eighty so percent. And then whatever you get on this, that goes towards your score. Okay. So the credit quiz is what decides 
the two points? Yes. Okay. That that's just yeah. That was my question. All right. Fair enough. And uh, one last question. It might be kind of dumb, but uh, on the test, are we allowed to have like scratch sheet of paper, like yes. especially for dimensional analysis, because yes. it'll yes. be kind of hard to like visualize. Yeah, but okay. you'll have to show me that scratch piece of paper in the room scan. Yeah, uh, in the beginning before the test, right? That's right. All right. Yeah, you'll be asked by Onlock to do a room scan. Mm -hmm. So you'll, you'll show me your your scrap paper there, okay? Yeah. Okay, that's it. I think I'm good. Thank you, Professor Musgrave. All right, no worries, Maximus. I'll see you later. Mm -hmm. Lauren, are you still on the call here? Lauren. All right.